Greetings and welcome back to room 303 and uh, the Harvard Classics Lectures uh, over volume number 4. This is lecture number 31 which will cover Paradise Regained Book 3. Um, hey, if you haven't done this, I recommend that you study with me at LearnStrong.net. Go to the site, go down the left hand side, find there the available Harvard Classics Lectures. Certainly, I would recommend that you watch my Paradise Lost lectures before you get into the study of Paradise Regained. But if you're going to jump right to the study of Paradise Regained, then I recommend that you work with, first of all, my intro lecture, number 28, and then I've given lectures on book one, that's 29, lecture 29 in book two, that's lecture 30. So this is lecture 31 on Par uh, Paradise Regained, book number uh, three. We continue our study um, with, with this uh, work from two different perspectives, remember. One, our understandings of learning as the ability to connect new information to old information, and more particularly, the three levels of reading. What does the text say? What does the text mean? How do I relate to the text at levels one, two, and three? And then we're also looking at these three multiple perspectives here in regards to Paradise Regained. Just like we did with Paradise Lost, we see the poem as an epic. We're going to, for example, see the epic catalog of Paradise Regained. Uh, book three. Uh, the philosophy and the theology, for example, the question about glory, the question about power, the question about military force, all will be a philosophic question for us. And then finally, the political questions as we outline them as, first of all, psychological. What do you need, for example, to be happy? That's a very interesting question. And then the sociological question, what do we need to be happy? These are questions that which, which could be revol uh, resolved. And of course, what happens when those two things come into some kind of conflict, right? Let's do a brief blot summary really quickly of Paradise Regained Book 1. Of course, that when Christ is baptized, he then goes off into the wilderness to be tempted. Of course, the first temptation coming from that Luke 4, Matthew 4, um, uh, from the Bible, from the Gospels account, uh, turn stones into bread, man shall not live by bread alone. That obviously is this question about what is it that you need to be happy? What are those, as Thoreau says it in Walden, the essential things of life? In the second book, we continue with the temptations here, and Satan is going to offer Christ in his starvation, in his hunger after 40 days of going without food, the opportunity to eat, and that is to say, to break your fast, okay? And we find here a very interesting debate about will versus sustained will. Now this is going to take us back to our conversation with Hamlet for just a moment. In the Act 3 soliloquy of to be or not to be, this conscience makes cowards of us all. The idea that there's two kinds of people, there's thinkers and there's doers. Why is it the case that some people have will, okay I'm going to do this as an athlete, I'm going to train or as a musician, I'm really going to practice, but then can't, can't sustain it. Sustained will, and where does it come from? Christ of course uh, Jesus in the, in, the, in the poem is going to represent a certain kind of sustained will that all athletes, of course, are going to envy. All those of us who aspire to some kind of learning are going to envy because after 40 days of going without food, he can say, I'll go without more cuisine until it's the right time. Let's turn now to book three and the opening lines of book three. Again, we don't have an argument like we have in the uh, Paradise Lost uh, uh, study. And we'll continue right away. We pick up with it. We've, we've finished the last conversation here, and now we're ready to begin. Christ has just finished talking at the end of book two. Now we get into book three. So spake the Son of God, and Satan stood a while as mute, confounded what to say, what to reply, confuted and convinced of his weak arguing and fallacious drift, at length collecting all his serpent wiles with soothing words renewed, him thus a cost. Now we'll pause for a moment and say three things really quickly. One, let's not forget, Milton is following in the tradition of the Platonic Dialogues. We're definitely going to have that interchange, that back and forth between interlocutors. Two, at the conclusion of the second book, Satan is pretty much dumbfounded in regards to, you're not really, you're not even going to go for this food that I'm offering to you. In other words, let's put it in our notes this way, Christ's, uh, Milton's Christ will have more discipline than Satan's, uh, uh, th than Milton's Satan, right? In other words, Satan uh, doesn't want to worship and so he gets thrown out of, uh, out of heaven. In other words, he, he doesn't have discipline. Christ has discipline, and for that, Satan's kind of dumbfounded for, for, um, for uh, a while here. But then he comes back. He says, 
I see thou knowest, and this will be ironic given that everything is about knowledge in Paradise Lost. I see thou knowest what is of use to know, what best to say canst say, to do canst do, thy actions to thy words accord. It's an interesting line. It's fascinating the way Milton, both in Paradise Lost and in Paradise Regained, will give Satan some of the more remarkable lines. Look what he just said. The challenge of all challenges is that your actions and your words go together. Now, of course, for Satan, it is completely the opposite, right? The, the father of lies, as he's been called, of course, right? Thy words to thy large heart give utterance to. Thy heart contains of good, wise, just, the perfect shape. So in other words, let's go ahead and put it in our notes this way. Satan right away is going to congratulate Christ. Now, obviously, anytime Satan is saying something good to, to Christ, it's obviously a setup for what's coming. But nonetheless, it does throw a really interesting challenge in our way. What does it mean to say that your words and your actions line up? Milton will argue that's a good sign. The interesting irony to follow, Satan is immediately going to suggest at line 20 that it's time that maybe Christ thinks about war, battle. Now, one of the reasons why I argue that Paradise Regained is such a brilliant text, even though it's not given often the necessary respect even by scholars, I think that what Milton is doing is coming to terms with some of his own, for lack of a better phrase, and forgive the irony of my saying it this way, Milton's coming to terms with some of his own demons. And I think one of the challenges for Milton, and we're going to see this played out in this book, is his pacifism. Milton was a pacifist who believed that war was not a good thing. And yet, he is, of course, a reader of the biblical text. And, of course, he is going to talk about the importance of battle, for example, in heaven and the throwing of Satan and his demons out of heaven. So it always seems that Milton is a little bit conflicted about how he's going to deal with battle. Note the irony, though, right? And obviously, we're talking about an epic poem. There's got to be irony of a kind. Note the irony that Satan, who got thrown out of heaven because he couldn't win a battle, is now going to recommend to Christ, hey, I think you need to go to war. I think you need a battle. At line 21, he will continue with this. Um, he says, in battle, though, against thy views and arms, these godlike virtues, wherefore dost thou hide, affecting private life or more obscure in savage wilderness? Wherefore deprive all earth her wonder at thy acts, thyself, the fame and glory. Glory! This is going to be an important word for us after our study of Beowulf, yes? The reward that soul excites to high attempts the flame of most erected spirits, most tempered, pure, ethereal, who all pleasures else despise, all treasures and all gain esteem as dross, and dignities and powers all but the highest. And then at line 31, thy years are ripe and overripe. In other words, he says, hey, it's time. He mentions, for example, an interesting list, Alexander the Great, Scipio, Pompey, and finally Julius Caesar. All of them knew what they needed to do when they were young. They were ready to go at it. He says, finally, at line 42, he says, uh, but thou art to, or, uh, but thou art uh, yet, though, but thou art, thou yet art not too late. The language of the syntax is a little strange, but fundamentally he says, it's not too late for you. Now, of course, the question will be, <clears throat> what is the real temptation here? Satan is offering to Christ. The real temptation, of course, is to preempt the plan of God and to take the power that Christ has and to turn it into some kind of martial greatness, right? At line 43, Christ will respond. Let's read it through line 63. The Savior calmly thus replied, Thou neither doth, uh, dost persuade me to seek wealth for empire's sake, money, nor empire to effect for glory's sake. I'm not going to be interested in glory. But all thy argument, for what is glory but the blaze of fame, the people's praise, if always praise, unmixed, and what the people but a herd confused, a miscellaneous rabble who extol things vulgar and well-weighed, scarce worth the praise. Now let's point out two observations at 3A for your notes, and some of you are already smiling because you know where this one's headed. Of course, this is a pretty elitist view, and it sounds very Platonist. Plato himself will say that when you give everybody the right to have a voice, you're going to get a lot of undisciplined political action. Of course, this also brings to mind, doesn't it, that famous line from Machiavelli's Prince, he who builds on the people builds on mud. Very good. So let's continue here. <clears throat> they praise and they admire 
they know not what, and know not whom, but as one leads the other, and what delight to be by such extolled, to live upon their tongues and be their talk, of whom to be dispraised, where no small praise his lot, who dares be singularly good. The intelligent among them and the wise are few, and the glory scarce of few is raised. This is true glory and renown. When God, looking on the earth with approbation, marks the just man and divulges him through heaven to all his angels, who with true applause recount his praise. And then he says it, thus he did to Job, for example. In other words, the response here is, you know, fame is a very dangerous thing. You'll remember those final lines from Keats's When I Have Fears, that on the shore of the wide world I stand alone and think till love and fame to nothingness do sink. The irony, of course, for Keats as well as I think for Milton is that we've got a bit of confliction here. I think that one of the things that's happening at the end of Milton's life is that he's coming to terms with the idea that he knows he's written this amazing epic poem, Paradise Lost. And now in Paradise Regained, he's trying to come to terms with the idea about fame and glory. Is it a good idea? Is it a bad idea? Why? Right? And what does it mean if people who you don't respect give you all kinds of flattery? I think for Milton, this is going to be a confliction as well. At line 75, uh, Satan will then, um, uh, or uh, at line 75, Christ is going to respond to this whole notion of going to war to get what you want. What are these worthies, this is sarcastic language, that is to say people that have gained what they needed through warfare. What are these worries but rob and spoil, burn, slaughter and enslave, peaceable nations, neighboring or remote, made captive yet deserving freedom more than those their conquerors who leave behind nothing but ruin whatsoever they rove and all the flourishing works of peace destroy. Now this is an interesting idea. This is Christ's response to the very notion about, uh, you know, um, war does not produce what you think it can produce. Of course, yeah, we've got, we, we've got to answer the question as Milton has to answer the question as a theologian. Well, yeah, but what about, for example, all those battles in the Old Testament? We just think about Joshua 10 and 11, for example, where story after story of small villages, towns being exterminated is actually a translation and often uh, out of the Hebrew there. Um, but what about the fact that war is the way in which religion often has propagated itself? How, how do you deal with that? We'll come back to it. At line 95, 96, we're told two great examples of people who set it out. Patient Job and poor Socrates, who next more memorable. But what he taught and suffered for so doing, for truth's sake, suffering death, unjust, lives now equal in flame to proudest conquerors. In other words, it's an interesting argument Milton makes that Socrates, he lived according to truth. By the way, we're going to get to this notion of the contest between truth and falsehood at the very end, the final lines of book three. You make a note of that. But notice here, he says, Job and Socrates both prove I can wait and I can be successful. The line 105, he asks, shall I seek glory then as vain men seek off not deserved? I seek not mine, my own glory, but his who sent me, and thereby witness whence I am. It's at this point that the notion of whether you should seek glory or not, of course, but coming back again to maybe Milton's quest to wonder it as well, um, and the idea that we, you know, really we don't, we don't need to seek glory if we live the right kind of life. Think, Satan will say, however, back to, to uh, Christ, to, to whom the tempter murmuring thus replied, it's an interesting verb, uh, think not so slight of glory, therein least resembling thy great father. Now this is an interesting line. Let's read down through line 20, uh, 120. And this is an interesting argument, and it's going to be one of the more disturbing uh, arguments of, of book three. Satan's going to say, hey, listen, what about, what about your father? What about God? Who demands glory and worship. And if you're the son of God, shouldn't you demand the same? It's an interesting argument. Let's follow it. God, he, the great father, he seeks glory, and for his glory all things made, all things orders and governs. Not content in heaven. Now this is an argument that Satan made, of course, in Paradise Lost as well, that God was not content and so he had to create. Which does beg the question, as we ask it in our earlier lectures in Paradise Lost, why would a perfect being, a perfect deity, who needs nothing, 
why would it, that being have to create in the first place? Like, what's the point? What, what would be the reason? What need would precede, if you will, creation? Not content in heaven by all his angels glorified requires glory from men. In other words, Satan says it's not enough that all the angels have to glorify God. He also, God also, wants men to glorify him. Of course, this is going to be a sore spot for Satan because it was the requirement of glorifying the Son that led Satan finally to say, yeah, I've had enough, and then ultimately to get thrown out of heaven, right? From all men, good or bad, wise or unwise, no indifference, no exemption, above all sacrifice or hallowed gift. Glory he requires and glory he receives, promiscuous from all nations, Jew or Greek or barbarous, nor, ex nor expectation, nor exception hath declared from us. His foes pronounce glory he exacts. In other words, well, what's up with this notion of wanting glory? I mean, doesn't your father demand glory regardless of whether you want to give it or not? Christ's response at line 121 is, a, is, is interesting. He says, well, yeah, it makes sense because a perfect being demands to be worshipped from imperfect beings, starting at line 134. He says it, But why should men seek glory who of his own hath nothing, and to whom nothing belongs but condemnation, ignominy, shame, who for so many benefits received turn recreant to God? In great, we immediately think of that Paradise Lost line, don't we, of book 3, line 97, and book 4, 42 to 48. The idea, in other words, is that humans, because they are created by God, should naturally, as Adam did when he first realized in Paradise Lost, remember that he was a created being, want to honor or worship the Creator, ingrate and false, and so of all true good himself despoiled, yet sacrilegious to himself would take that which to God alone of right belongs, yet so much bounty is in God, such grace, that who advance his glory, not their own, them he himself to glory, will advance. In other words, he's going to make the argument that glory when it is man's glory is empty. But when it is the glory of God, it is a different understanding of glory. So spake the Son of God, we're told. And then at line, one four, uh, at line uh, uh, 150, Satan will come back, right? And he says it, of glory as thou wilt, said he, so deem, worth or not worth the seeking, let it pass. But to a kingdom thou art born. Now this is going to be the next part of the temptation. And the argument is going to be made here for Satan. You were born to have a kingdom. That is to say, to be a king. And if you're going to do that, then you're going to need to have an army. There's got to be some fighting involved. And there's got to be some energy and some zeal involved. At line 177, he says it. Let move thee zeal and duty. Zeal and duty are not slow, but on occasions forelock watchful wait. They themselves rather are occasion best. We think here of uh, Psalm uh, 69, 9, uh, don't we, right? Zeal for thy father's house, the John 2, 17 uh, reference. Duty to free thy country from her heathen servitude. He says, the Hebrews have been enslaved a number of times, isn't it time that you free your people and go to war, in other words? Um, of course, uh, that, that idea for Christ will be responded to at line 182. All things are best fulfilled in their due time. In other words, all in due time. And he continues uh, on through to line 202. And that time is for all things. We think of the book of Ecclesiastes or Hamlet, the readiness is all. Truth hath said, if of my reign prophetic writ hath told, that it shall never end, so when begin the Father in his purpose hath decreed, he in whose hand all times and seasons row. Milton loves that word, row. What if he hath decreed that I shall first be tried in humble state? I love that Milton has Christ say, what if? In other words, it almost seems as if the son here in the wilderness is trying to explain, trying to gain some understanding as to what is it that I'm supposed to be learning here in the middle of all this pain. Of course, we've said it in earlier lectures, but it will be the answer to this question of theodicy. Why is bad stuff happening? Not to me, but rather for me. And here, notice, the son will kind of echo that idea. I'm trying to figure out what I'm supposed to be learning from all this bad stuff that's happening to me, like going for 40 days without eating in the wilderness, things adverse, by tribulations, injuries, insults, contempts, and scorns, and snares, and violence, suffering, abstaining, quietly expecting, without distrust or doubt, that he may know what I can suffer, 
how obey. Again, just to point it out, no longer ask why is this happening to me, but rather learn to ask why is this happening for me. This is one of the answers to the theodistic question. It's certainly Milton's answer. Makes sense, Milton, the blind Milton, soon to die that Milton, writing in this poem. I think this is powerful stuff. Milton is talking to himself, I think, in a lot of ways. Who best can suffer, best can do, best reign, who first well hath obeyed. Notice the inverse of the Paradise Lost lines, better to reign in heaven, or better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. And Christ here will say quite the opposite. The challenge is to learn first obedience and then you can begin the process of reigning, however you wish to define that. Just trial, ere I merit my exaltation without change or end. And then he changes and he says, but what concerns it thee, talks now to Satan, why do you care? When I began my everlasting kingdom, why art thou solicitous? What moves thy inquisition? Knowest thou not that my rising is thy fall? It's a fascinating inverse, right? I, again, Paradise Regained has these wonderful reversals. My rising is thy fall. My promotion will be thy destruction. I mean, he makes a fine point. Dude, why are you trying to help me gain my kingdom? In the moment I gain my kingdom, Paradise Regained, you are going to fall even worse than the fall that you've already experienced. It's a, fascinating, it's a fascinating argument. At line 203 to 250, Satan has an amazing speech. And in the end, it's really focusing on this notion of self-doubt. Let's just take a look at it. To whom the tempter inly racked replied. This torturing on the inside takes us back to Paradise Lost, uh, book one, lines 125, 126. It's like he's conflicted in his own thinking. Let that come when it comes. He's talking now about himself. All hope is lost of my reception into grace. What worse? For where no hope is left, is left no fear. Right? In other words, he says, I got nothing to fear about whether you come to power or not. I'm done. I'm jacked, in other words. If there